Have you had back pain or headaches or perhaps some other form of pain that's keeping you from sleeping well? Or perhaps the pain in itself has become an ongoing struggle? Well, if any of this is true, then this episode will be, I hope, really helpful for you. In today's episode of Mining the Comments, we'll do things a little bit differently. We will not look at a comment from you know, from our YouTube channel or from Instagram or anything like that, but rather a comment on pain. <laughs> actually, what happened was I got a, I got a message uh, via Instagram, actually, and I thought this could make a really good mind in the comments episode. So, so here we are. Anyways, let's jump right into it. This came in from um, Emma a, a few days ago, and we will read this together. Emma says, hello, Daniel. Thank you so much for everything. I continue to not struggle with sleep after graduating from Insomnia Immunity which is wonderful. I tell so many clients and friends about you and how you changed my life in a way I never thought possible. I seriously send pretty much everyone who's important to me to your channel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. So, so glad to hear this, of course. And I wanted to share it with uh, the community as well. I'm now struggling with a slightly different thing. Do you have any videos or podcasts on chronic pain and sleep? I have been in a lot of pains from some herniated discs recently and I distract a lot during the day to not feel the pain. I dread going to bed and being with the pain, even though I know the answer is to be with it and accept it. Sleep itself isn't exactly the struggle, but rather the uncomfortable feeling of being with the pain. If you don't have anything on this, I completely understand. Just thought I'd check. I appreciate you. Appreciate you very much as well, Emma. And um I have actually thought a lot about creating some content specifically on this, but this kind of gave me an opportunity. So let's jump in and use this comment from Emma to to learn in a way that I hope will be really helpful. So there are sort of two things I want to talk about. One is uh, sleep disruption versus insomnia. And then we're going to talk more about like chronic pain and self in the light of our philosophy, our natto ways, if you will. So the first thing, uh, you know, maybe obvious to some, some, some of us here in the in some some in the in the community here, but I really want to point to it anyway. Pain can definitely create sleep disruption, no doubt about that. But only the fear of not sleeping creates insomnia. What do I mean with this? Is if somebody has, let's say, a back injury and their back hurts, are they going to sleep well? It's very unlikely. I think anyone with you know significant pain will have some trouble sleeping, which is completely natural. You know, it's just, you know, pain makes us a little bit hyper aroused. It's, it, it, you know, it, it's there, like the pain signal is there to keep us, you know, alert to point to this is a problem area. This is a problem area, right? We're not supposed to sleep when we are in pain. You know, that's kind of the idea in the brain anyway. Like, we, you know, the, the, the idea with pain is like, look at this area, pay attention to this. So it's very, very natural that we don't sleep well. When we have pain, our sleep is disrupted. But This doesn't mean we have an ongoing self-sustaining struggle with sleep. That doesn't come from pain. That comes from when we are scared of not sleeping, that, that, that feeds itself. So my point here is that anyone who has, you know, we can have, uh, we can have pain and we can have a lot of sleep disruption without having insomnia. And then when the pain subsides, then, you know, the sleep, sleep disruption automatically fades and, uh, and so forth. So uh, again, I point this out in writing as well. Most, if not everyone with back pain will have sleep disruption. Not all will have sleep struggles. So that is my my first point there. There's a very big difference between sleep disruption and insomnia. Now, now we're going to look at more like, okay, what if somebody has had like this kind of chronic pain situation or maybe like Emma is maybe afraid that, oh, maybe this is becoming sort of a chronic pain uh, uh, struggle for me. What can we think about then? Well, I want to start really, really big picture and say the following. Our, our brain communicates with us uh, through messages, which is thoughts. And I, I think of them as, I think of thoughts as messages because we can really clearly identify a thought. Like this is what I'm thinking about. We can like spell it out. It communicates uh, with us through signals, which are emotions, you know, fear, happiness, sadness, anger, and disgust. Those are sort of the core emotions. And they, they are, you know, they, they have various practical purposes. And uh, cues as well. The brain also communicates with us through cues. And cues are things we can feel, like I feel hungry, I feel pain, I feel cold. Those are, you know, uh, very obvious, uh, you know, 
<laughs> the, the message behind the excuse is very obvious. Like, I feel very cold. Okay, put on a sweater, right? I feel hungry, time to eat, et cetera, et cetera. Now, with, with this, this, so I, I just, you know, I start big picture because I want to highlight something. And what I want to highlight is that the communication itself is never wrong, if you will. Like, there's not never anything wrong with an emotion. It's just, it's just the way, it's just a communication. There's nothing wrong with pain itself. It's just the way the brain communicates with us. Uh, now, uh, you know, with that said, you know, someone may think like, why am I feeling anxious all the time? Like, clearly that's not indicated because there's nothing going on. There's no real, there's no threat as far as I can tell. Well, that's when the brain gets confused. The brain can think there is a threat. For example, with insomnia, it's like the brain is confused and thinks that being awake is a threat, a danger, something it needs to defend us against. And then we can be, you know, feeling anxious all the time because the brain, the brain is basically like sending that the message like, oh, there's something to get away from, something you need to do. But the anxiety itself is not a problem or wrong. If there's just some confusion that's producing it. Okay. So again, the communication itself is not never wrong, but there can be some, uh, some uh, confusion behind it, so to speak. And here's another thing that communication is also often uncomfortable, which is intentional. Uh, you know, when we're feeling angry is not supposed to feel quote unquote good because anger is supposed to propel us to do something. Pain is not supposed to feel comfortable. Like the whole point is that we're supposed to like, uh, you know, this is, this is hot. Oh, I feel pain. It's supposed to make us take our hand away so we don't get hurt. It's a safety thing. It's intentionally uncomfortable. And because it is uncomfortable, it is something we don't want to feel. And that can lead us to actually becoming afraid of it. We can actually become afraid of the communication. We can become afraid of a message. We can become afraid of a signal or we, we can become afraid of a cue like pain. We can become afraid of it. And when we become afraid of pain, we inadvertently sort of teach the brain that, oh no, pain is bad. And then the brain's like, okay, we get a monitor for pain so we don't have more of it. And of course, when we look for something, we find it and then we become more scared. Like, oh no, there it is. And we become more hyper aroused. Our nervous system becomes like really, really jumpy and, 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 and more sensitive. And then we experience more pain as well. I have a little personal anecdote to share with you. Something that happened many, many years ago, but I still remember it. And for some reason, my brain thought that was important. So I still remember it very vividly. I think I was in my teens and we were with uh, our family some type of uh, a beach somewhere. And somebody has said that there are, um, uh, what do you call them? Those uh, jellyfish, that they're jellyfish that can sting uh, in the water. And so I was like, that was in my mind. I was just waiting in the water. And suddenly in the corner of my eye, I see something dark, you know, in the, in the, in the water. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a jellyfish. And suddenly I feel it like this really, really, you know, terrible pain in my, in my calf, you know, I was like, ow, then I looked down and it's just a piece of plastic that's floating around and immediately the pain is gone, but it just shows that when we are hyper aroused, when we're scared, you know, even slight touch can feel really painful because we're, you know, we're in that, uh, you know, we're in a hyper aroused state. We're in a scared mode, if you will. And again, this can become its own loop when we're scared of feeling pain that makes us more hyper aroused and more sensitive and then we feel more pain, and then we become even more afraid of it. If this sounds familiar, yes, it's exactly how insomnia happens. We can become awake uh, for a random reason where there's some stress, and then we think, oh, no, this is not supposed to happen. Then we become more afraid of being awake. That makes us more awake, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, I made a little note to myself to show the book. Now, a, a lot of what I'm sharing here actually became very, very clear to me when I learned, uh, when I studied this book, Unlearn Your Pain, by Howard Schubiner, which someone, uh, I think was a client of mine, recommended. And she, she said, oh, hey, you should read this book. It's like so similar to what you teach. And it truly, truly is. Uh, uh, one thing that struck me in the book was how the, the author said that a radiologist cannot tell the difference between a good back or a bad back by, by MRI. Like MRI findings, CAT scans, and stuff like that. If you just give a random, you know, um, random imagery to a radiologist, they will not be able to tell which person has back pain and which person does not. And it's the same thing with insomnia. Like if you give um, 
EEG readings, like sleep study findings to a sleep expert, they cannot tell which person said that I sleep well and which person says I have insomnia. So again, it's, it's in both circumstances, um, the objective findings are not, don't matter at all as much as like the subjective parts of it, how, how we think about things, how, uh, how scared we are of experiencing something, right? And now this takes us to, um, you know, a little bit kind of deeper into our teaching here. And it was, I, I but I really wanted to mention this uh, because it's something I'm, I'm planning to talk more and more about. And it is tokenization. Tokenization is when a harmless experience be, uh, comes to represent danger to the brain. And, uh, 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 you know, a token is, so, so a token itself is something harmless that has started to represent danger to the brain. That's the token. And the reason I, I want to mention this, I want to start talking more about this, is that every inner struggle we have, whether it is like, let's say, you know, OCD, panic attacks, you know, social phobia, you know, uh, has a token. And maybe many, more than one, but often there's kind of a, a chief token, a main token that is sort of driving the struggle. And with insomnia, we know wakefulness is the token. Wakefulness is a harmless state of mind that has come to represent danger and then we can have a struggle with, I just randomly picked this one, with health anxiety, uncertainty, uncertainty about well-being specifically is the token. It's the, it's the thing that is harmless. Being uncertain is something none of us is certain about our health at all, but uncertainty can come to represent danger. And, and that is the, the sort of central token with health anxiety. And with, with the chronic pain, pretty obvious, pain is a token. Pain in itself is harmless but it can become something we think represents danger, something we think, oh, this shouldn't be happening. This means something's wrong. I shouldn't have this much pain. And then uh, it becomes amplified. And, you know, it, it, we, we're going to go back to Emma's message, but uh, let, let's stay here for a second. So it, with insomnia, uh, one of the things we teach is, is befriending wakefulness, which, uh, which basically means that we take something that the brain has started to think of as a threat, a danger, an opponent, an enemy, uh, something like that. And we say, maybe we can teach ourselves, teach the brain that it is actually harmless, you know? And it, when we befriend the token, whatever the token is, we reverse the tokenization process, you know? It becomes, the brain again sees that, oh, this is, this is harmless. This is not something I need to be uh, afraid of. And then, you know, we, we, may, we may still experience pain, for example, wakefulness at night, we will experience uncertainty, but there will be no struggle. Uh, you know, there will be, there will be, you know, peace of mind and peaceful sleep. Uh, uh, you know, there may be some sleep disruption, but again, there, there may not be any, there, there's not going to be any struggle. And with that, going back to what Emma said, uh, let's actually look at it together. Um, we can see that there is a, a lot of insight here. Uh, First one I want to say is this one, like I dread going to bed. We can see that Emma is identifying that there is a fear component here. There is a fear of pain present. And just knowing that seeing that gives us a real foundation, which is really, really helpful. And uh, Emma also says, I know the answer is to be with it and accept it. And, you know, the, th the thing with that is that I think we can, it's so easy, it's, you know, it's easy to say that. And it's true. Like that's true for so many, so many things we struggle with. Right. But I think it, it's sometimes difficult to accept something when we don't really understand why we're experiencing it so much. So that, that's why I think education, like what we're doing here can be so helpful. We understand that, aha, there has been this process of tokenization probably, and this is amplify the pain. And that's why it's there. And then there's less mystery. We're like, okay, now I understand that it's not strange or unusual. This is something, you know, that happens a lot. And, uh, and then it can be a little bit easier to accept and let go. And um, I have a, one more comment on this that we'll go back to. But firstly, I also, I also want to say um, this one. I want to comment on this one. I distract myself a lot during the day to not feel the pain that really, really is part of this tokenization process that we see all the time, for example, when it comes to insomnia, that the more we try to avoid something we're afraid of, the more we're teaching the brain that this is something we should be afraid of, and the more it bothers us, you know, with insomnia itself. And like we, we try to, you know, uh, 
uh, take supplements or use blackout curtains and things like that and, and, and try to like kind of block the pain and then it becomes stronger. And, and we can see that it's the same process when it comes to pain. The more we're like, okay, no, I don't want to feel the pain. I want to look this way. I don't want to look that way. We're sort of telling the telling the brain that, oh, no, we don't experience pain. We got to distract ourselves as soon as we feel pain because pain is really bad. And that becomes part of this tokenization process. And just, and again, seeing this is so helpful because it can lead in the opposite direction of being like, oh, there's the pain. And, and seeing if we're willing to experience it in that moment. And, and that doesn't mean we need to like do nothing else and just be like, okay, pain is good. This is good to feel this way. Of course not. No human being likes to feel pain. Nobody wants to feel pain. But when we understand that trying to escape it creates more struggle for us, then we can actually do maybe the same thing. We can, whatever the distraction was, we can do that, but with a different intent. The intent now is not trying to escape the pain, but the intent becomes, okay, I can do this, whatever it is. And the intent is that makes it a little easier to experience the pain. It makes it a little bit easier to have the pain. It makes it more acceptable that I have the pain when I, you know, get a massage or lay still or watch some TV or whatever it is. When the intent is this makes it more easier to experience the pain, then we reverse that tokenization. Then we then we teach the brain that pain is just just a, just a, a communication. It's not dangerous in itself. Uh, and, um, and that, that can be, uh, you know, really, really helpful. I'm trying to think if there's anything more, but I think that was it. Um, Emma, let me know how this sounded. And, uh, uh in the comment section, that'd be really, really nice. And same thing for anyone else in the audience. Uh, any thoughts, comments, uh, on this, please put them in the, in the comment section. And with that said, we will conclude for this week. It's been super nice uh, having you here this week and look forward to next week. Uh, where we have a really, really nice uh, uh, success story to share that I'm excited with and, and much, much more. But anyways, that was it for this week. Have a wonderful weekend. See you soon.